Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Shout, the online conference series brought to you by the Smithsonian, Microsoft Partners in Learning and Taking It Global. We're really delighted to have you all with us. Um, if you joined us for the first session, we hope you had a great experience. And if you missed it, do note that we did record it, and we'll be posting it together with all of the other Shout online conference sessions on the same website that you use to enter our session today. You can also find links to them from shoutlearning.org at any time. As you know, we're going to be turning our attention to the sky in order to look back down at the Earth. And uh, we're going to hear from Andrew Johnston in just a moment. But I wanted to give you a chance to uh, get acclimated, because we had a few people who are, are new joining us today. First of all, I wanted to point out that at any point during the session, you can drop in your questions, your comments, or maybe even resources uh, that you'd like to share with others. Over on the left side of the screen, there's a little chat box. So feel free to jump in there. You can even type in any introductions you'd like. Uh, even before we get started, I am seeing that we've got people joining us from all over. We have a number of middle schools uh, who are here with us uh, as well with uh, their classes. And so hello to all of you. Hello to uh, our friends in uh, Santo Domingo uh, at the Essex Middle School in Vermont and uh, also to the Winfield Middle School and to so many others who are here with us as well. Um, and I won't forget the early logs, login of uh, Brooke Haller and her class in Lytton, British Columbia. Hello to the fourth, fifth, and sixth graders there. So we we'll look forward to hearing from you and hearing your questions as we go along. And at the very end of the session, I'll also be back uh, with some ways that you can continue to follow up and continue to explore this topic. I did want to mention also that while we are here today learning from Andrew and having a conversation with him, our friend Chris Wilson is logged in from the UK, and Chris is capturing what he hears in the form of an illustration. And for those of you who are here during our session with Jim Deutsch, here is an early preview of Chris's drawing of that great session on the US Forest Service. So once that is all ready to go, we'll post it up on the site along with the recording of Jim's session. But while we're at it, I wanted to show you uh, Chris's blank canvas right now. So you can see the progress before and after as Chris draws out what he hears. Now, this is a session that's going to be rich in imagery nonetheless. So, so Chris's challenge in capturing what he hears in the form of an illustration will be that much more interesting for all of us to, uh, to watch. So thank you, Chris, for being our artist. Thanks to our friends at WGBH who are captioning the session. And you'll see those captions appearing below. If for any reason you wish to turn off the captions, there's a pull down menu and where it says WGBH on the lower right side of your screen, you can change that to no captions to toggle that on and off. All right, well, there's a lot to uh, explore today and we have a great distance to travel all the way up to uh, space to look back down at the place we call home. So I'm going to turn the floor over to Andrew Johnston, who is a geographer at the Center for Earth and Planetary Studies at the National Air and Space Museum, one of my favorite places. He researches what's called remote sensing technology for studying regional environmental trends. So we can look at things like land cover and uh, natural changes in things like forest dynamics. He's going to tell us a lot more about that. You should also know, by the way, that he serves as curator and content expert for the uh, museum's planetarium exhibitions and for programs that relate to astronomy and space, uh, space exploration uh, and even the programming that happens inside of the planetarium through the traveling ex exhibition known as Earth from Space, our topic for today. Andrew, thanks for being here. Thanks very much. and I'm very happy to be here today. And it's especially exciting to see uh, comments from people all over the world that have already logged in. So uh, let's get right into uh, the subject at hand, which is Earth from Space. Um, as uh, Jonathan just mentioned, I'm a geographer, which means I actually look at the Earth, the planet that we all live on. And in order to do that, I use techniques uh, that are a little bit different than just standing on the Earth. I actually use satellites in orbit that look down at the surface of the Earth. If you look at the screen right now, there's a, an image that shows a tropical storm and part of North America and, and the Atlantic Ocean. These are some of the imagery that we use to understand how the surface of the, of the Earth changes through time. So what I'm going to do in the next few minutes is try to explain a little bit about how some of this technology works. I'm sure many of you have seen images from space. Uh, these days, people are used to seeing these images 
on the Internet and, and from other sources. But I'm going to try to reveal a little bit about how that technology works. Then I'll show you a selection of different kinds of images. Some of these images are collected for very specific technical purposes, but some of them are also just pretty to look at. So we'll talk about the science and the technology, but we'll also just uh, enjoy uh, some of the images. First, I want to talk about how we actually look at the whole global view. So we have this uh, view of the entire planet that you see on the screen right now. It actually comes to us from a certain kind of satellite. But depending on what we want to do, sometimes we actually look at the whole globe in this kind of view, or sometimes we actually zoom down into tiny, uh, smaller areas. Uh, here's an image that actually is centered on the city of Washington, D.C., which happens to be where I'm sitting. So sometimes when we want to look at how cities change, we'll look at this kind of scale or this kind of area. The area you're looking at is about 100 miles or 170 kilometers from left to right. But we can keep on zooming in. Uh, the image is still centered on Washington, D.C., but now we're looking at an area that's only about six miles wide or about eight kilometers wide. And we can even zoom in closer. I'm sure a lot of you are used to doing that, where you go to map servers on the Internet and you look at your own backyard or maybe uh, your neighbor's house and so forth. So depending on what we're interested in observing, whether we're looking at large things like weather patterns, we want to see lar large areas, or if we want to zoom into tiny details, we want to see individual houses. There are different satellites that provide different kinds of, uh, of information. Now, if you look at the screen now, there are six different maps of the world that are actually color-coded to show different kinds of themes. And each of these maps comes from satellite data. Just as an example, the uh, image on the upper left shows the uh, sea surface temperature, actually the, the temperature of the seawater. The image on the upper right shows the aerosols or microscopic particles that are floating around in the atmosphere. The middle left uh, image shows a uh, cloud cover. The brighter the part of the image is, the more clouds there are. Uh, these kinds of maps, these global maps that show different themes are actually made from satellite data. And we can make maps that show these kinds of global themes and they change every month. So there are images that, this, that, are, that are produced uh, every month and they're updated. So we're starting to understand how the Earth works as a system. Uh, but first, I want to tell you a little bit about how these actu actually these tools work. Uh, I like to call them the tools of the trade. The image in the background that you see there is of uh, the harbor in St. John's, Antigua, in the Caribbean. And that's a cruise ship that you see in the middle of the screen there. That's it right there. But that's just one kind of image we get. On the screen right now are many different uh, satellites that return images. These are satellites we call remote sensing. Remote sensing is just a funny word for looking at things from a distance. But each of these satellites that you see up there are in orbit right now, and they have sensors and cameras uh, in space that actually look down at the, at the surface of the Earth. The uh, satellite that you see here in, in the upper left is what we call a GOES satellite. It's an acronym that stands for Geostationary Operational Environmental Satellite. And that's, uh, more simply, a weather satellite. If you've ever watched television and you see the news uh, show pictures of weather patterns moving around, this is the kind of satellite that returns that kind of data. Uh, the one in the center here, uh, in the, uh, on the top there, is a satellite called Landsat 7. And next to it, right here, is a satellite called Landsat 5. The Landsat series of satellites were launched and operated by the United States for remote sensing of the land surface to see how things change on the land. In other words, where crops are being grown, where forests are growing, where cities are spreading, things like that. There's also this SPOT satellite right there. It's called SPOT-5. That's a European version of the same kind of a satellite. It does, uh, the technology is, is very similar. Down at the bottom, we have uh, two satellites called Terra, right there, and Aqua. These are two satellites operated by NASA, the U.S. Uh, Space Agency, and what they do is collect data on environmental processes and environmental uh, changes. The satellite on the left here is a polar orbiting uh, weather satellite. It also carries a sensor that detects light being emitted from the surface of the Earth. I'll show you one image in a few minutes made from that satellite. And on the right side, we have, we have three uh, different satellites that are, uh, that are slightly different. This one is called Iconos. This one is called QuickBird. This one is called OrbView2. 
These are kinds of satellites that are actually launched by private companies. These are the satellites that return very detailed images, the kinds of things that allow us to see individual buildings on the surface of the Earth. The satellites in the middle all return images that cover a few hundred miles or a few hundred kilometers on a side, whereas that upper left satellite that I pointed out in the beginning looks at the entire surface of the Earth all at once. It returns an image showing the whole hemisphere. So this satellite on the upper left is in a slightly more distant orbit, and that's how it can actually detect uh, the, the whole Earth at one time. Well, here's a schematic diagram showing what, what you need to do a remote sense to have a remote sensing satellite. This is a graphic that shows Landsat 7, but you need, as you can see here, you need a sensor, you need something that returns images, and you need solar panels for collecting uh, electricity, for generating electricity, and then you need these antenna right here, and these things actually transmit the data back to the surface of the Earth. The way it works is that this sensor here looks at a surface uh, down on the surface of the Earth in, in this little track that's actually indicated right here. And it takes pictures co constantly, and that, those are actually digital data that are radioed back down to the surface of the Earth and received by a ground station where we actually do the processing in computers to make pictures out of them. I mentioned earlier there are different orbits these satellites can go into. We have what's called a geostationary orbit that you see right there. That's where we put these weather satellites. Out in that distant orbit, a satellite can see the whole Earth all at once. But all the other pictures that I'm showing you come from this kind of orbit right here, a polar orbit that's much closer in. So we're only seeing an area of a couple hundred miles on each side. And I also have to tell you a little bit about the electromagnetic spectrum, which is just different kinds of light. All the light that we see with our eyes is right here in the electromagnetic spectrum. These are the colors that we see with our eyes, just below the pointer here. But there are different kinds of light that we can't see with our eyes. The one you need to keep in mind today is this part of the spectrum called infrared. All the images I'll be showing you today, almost all of them, use both the visible and the infrared parts of the spectrum. Now, even though our eyes cannot see infrared light, it's a very useful to look at the surface of the Earth in infrared light, and I'll explain why in just a little bit. I won't spend a lot of time on this, but here's how we actually make a picture. I know you can't see on your screen these uh, boxes here, but they actually all show different numbers. These are what we call digital images, just like your digital camera. Each number represents a brightness value, and we can make pictures out of those brightness values. You see this bright shape right here. Then, in computer programs, we apply colors to these different wavelengths of light. These are three different wavelengths of light. We can apply red, green, and blue to those wavelengths of light. We add those three together, and we get a full color picture, which is what you see here on the lower right. Now, you've got two images on your screen right now that actually show the city of Indianapolis on different times to show you the different kinds of technology that we use. On the right is an image showing Indianapolis in 1965 from a camera that's called Corona. It was actually in orbit around the Earth, and it was actually a film camera. Now, sometimes with young people, I need to explain what a film camera is, but this was a camera that actually uh, used uh, chemicals and film, and actually ha you had to actually take the film in for processing. In this case, the film was in space, and it was returned to the Earth in a reentry capsule, and then it was processed. You see the area right here, the black and white image? You see right here where these two uh, rivers meet? That's represented right here in the color image. So you can see the black and white image only occupies about this area in central Indianapolis. The image on the right is from 2001. That's from the Landsat 7 satellite. It's a color image that shows the urban area in the center and agricultural plots uh, outside. So this shows the change in technology. Many decades ago, we only had black and white images, and they were very slow to come back to the Earth, whereas now we can get imagery that comes back very quickly and is updated all the time. And Andrew, this is Jonathan here. We, we have a, a question in, uh, from uh, Brooks' class, Colin in particular. Wants to get a sense of the scale of some of the satellites you were talking about. Some of the scale of the images? Uh, not of the images, but of the actual satellites. How big are they? Oh, really good question. Yes, each of these uh, satellites, actually, if it's okay, let me back up and I'll show you those, those diagrams here. Okay, you see all these, this satellite that you see right here that I was pointing out here, Landsat 7, 
that's about the size of a, of a really small car from here to here. Uh, same with this satellite. You, you, a really tiny car from go, would go from about here to here. Now, th this satellite, the Terra satellite, is uh, almost the size of a minivan from here to there. So it's a larger vehicle. Whereas the three satellites on the right, this one and this one and this one, are somewhat smaller. They're, well, I used to say they're the size of a telephone booth, but I'm not sure if people know what telephone booths are anymore. <laughs> um, but let's say they're, they're the size of a small desk. That's, that's a really good question. The, the, the reason these satellites are larger is because they, they, uh, they collect a very, they carry a lot of sensors, a dozen different cameras, whereas these satellites only carry one each. I see one question has come in, is it, can, can you get a, a, a three-dimensional uh, three image of the surface of the Earth? Actually, there are ways of doing that, uh, but unfortunately I won't have time to go into that in this presentation, but you can actually use radar to get images of the topography or the shape of the surface of the Earth, and you can actually simulate a three-dimensional image. What you're looking at here, if you look at the left and right sides uh, of, the, uh, of this image, so if you look here, and here, this is what uh, the western desert of Egypt looks like if you're uh, using the wavelengths of light that your eye can see. So it looks like sand, and it's all covered by sand. But in the middle is the exact same part of the uh, land surface, but in this case we're using radar. This is radar that was actually carried on the space shuttle. And you see this little area here that's a little bit brighter? It's kind of uh, looks like a drainage channel. In fact, that's exactly what it is. These are old drainage channels that are now buried by desert sand. With the radar, we're actually able to see through a little bit of the desert sand. You can't see very much through it, and the sand has to be very, very dry. But if the conditions are right, you can actually get a hint at what the, the geology was like uh, in the past. Now, here's a, an image that shows the center part of Washington, D.C. This is from the QuickBird satellite. So this returns these really detailed images. In fact, I'm going to zoom in to this building right there because that is where I'm sitting right now. So this is the, and in fact, I might as well, I'm actually sitting right about there. If you could see through the ceiling, you'd, you'd see me waving uh, up right now. Uh, and if you look on the street, you can see individual vehicles parked here. And if you look really closely, you can even see a couple of individual people uh, that just happen to be casting long shadows. Uh, this is the kind of detailed imagery that we can get from this newer generation of satellites that are launched by, by commercial companies. And, and as I said, yeah, yeah go ahead. I was uh -huh. just going to say you're, you're indeed answering some of the questions that are coming in. Uh, the fact that you can see those, those people and, and their shadows uh, was one of the questions that have come up. Uh-huh. Yeah, the, uh, uh, there are, in fact, there are even newer satellites that actually return images even more detailed than this. Uh, and as I said, I'm sure a lot of the people that are uh, watching right now have seen these kinds of images when they go onto these internet map servers. Uh, sometimes the images come from photographs taken from airplanes, but many of them actually use these, these satellites as well. Uh, what I'm going to do now is show you a few different kinds of things that we can see uh, from orbit looking down, it divided into different themes. Now, one of the things we do with these satellites is we look at living things. You look at how biology is active everywhere on the surface of the Earth. Uh, in the background uh, behind the title there, this is an image of the Florida Everglades. Uh, this, uh, this is from the Landsat 7 satellite. Now, as you might imagine, these colors are not real. If you were to go to the Florida Everglades, it doesn't really look like this. The reason the colors look like that is because this satellite image is made up of wavelengths of light in the infrared part of the spectrum. So we're assigning colors that we can see to make the infrared visible, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to see it with our eyes. So the different colors show that there's different levels of infrared light being reflected by the surface. And that, in turn, tells us something about the vegetation. So you're looking at different densities and different kinds of vegetation in this image. With one example, you can see, see that the horizontal line right there? That's actually a, an airplane runway. And then the other horizontal lines is actually a highway. But other than that, you're looking at a lot of vegetation. Uh, this is one of those images that comes uh, from the satellites that look at weather patterns. So we're looking at the entire uh, one hemisphere of the Earth. And if you look at the image, we have uh, right here we have tropical weather systems coming into North America. That's where North America is here. South America is down here. 
Atlantic Ocean, Pacific Ocean. So these satellites are in very distant orbits where we can see the whole surface of the Earth, but we are able to get images of at least once an hour from these kinds of satellites so that we can actually see, uh, see shapes uh, of weather patterns uh, changing and as, they're, as they're moving around. Uh, Andrew, do we still have you? I think we may have lost Andrew's connection. So hold on, we'll get him right back. Hello, Jonathan. Are you there? We are. Thank you. I was getting. I'm sorry. To, to, to try I don't to, know what happened there. That's all right. Um, I, I felt lost in space for a second. <laughs> so did we, but we're so glad you're back. So thanks. Great. So should I just uh, go right back in? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Great. Okay. So if if you look at the screen now, you're looking at uh, data from the same kind of satellite that looks at weather patterns. But if you take a look, everybody take a look at the screen, and you see this long band of clouds in the center. That's something called the intertropical convergence zone, and that is where a lot of rainfall happens because that part of the Earth uh, gets more sunlight around the equator uh, than elsewhere. And so you actually have more clouds being formed and more rain, which explains why there are tropical forests uh, standing there. So this is the kind of weather pattern, as I said, that we can see change on a daily basis but then also a monthly uh, and, and yearly basis. This is a neat image from the Landsat 5 satellite. It was returned back in 1989. Sometimes people look at this image and they say, well, you've drawn something on it. But in fact, this is actually how it looks. Uh, this is uh, uh, Mount uh, Taranaki in New Zealand. Take a look. In the center, that's the mountain. And the circles that you see, the large circle around the mountain, is actually the boundary of a national park. What happened the day before the satellite pulled, uh, flew overhead is there was a light snowfall. And that snowfall is very visible uh, in the agricultural areas around the park, but within the park there's more trees standing, so they cast shadows, so it looks darker. So it just happened to be a uh, happenstance that the satellite was able to see that, uh, but it actually shows you uh, th this, uh, this protected area, as I said, this national park. Uh, observing protected areas is one of the main applications for these kinds of satellite images. Uh, this is... Um, uh, on, if you look at the center of, of this image here, we're looking at the Yucatan Peninsula, which is in the middle here. Now I'm going to turn on my pointer. If you see right here, you see there's a straight line. This line is actually the border between Mexico on this side and Guatemala on that side. The reason there's a different color is because the different color shows you different densities of vegetation. This is from a, a sensor called MODIS on the Terra satellite, and that green color shows that there's... Uh, denser tree cover on the Guatemala side of the border than there is on the Mexican side of the border. That's just because there's uh, different uh, settlement patterns and different rules about what kinds of trees can be planted and, and removed. Uh, another thing we do with these kinds of satellite images is we actually look at uh, geology, or as I call it, the structure of the land. In the background there, you see the Himalayan mountains and the Indian subcontinent. Now, this image that you're seeing there is not a snapshot. This is actually a processed image using data from different dates. One way you can tell that is that there's no clouds in this image. If you ever see an image of the Earth and there's absolutely no clouds, if it covers a really large area, you know that it's been processed to do that. So it's a combination of different dates. This is the Kamchatka Peninsula, part of Russia. Uh, on the, uh, facing the Pacific Ocean. It shows the same area. Now on the left, the colors indicate different altitudes. Remember I was mentioning before about radar data. We actually use radar to, we can use it to see how high certain mountains are. The different colors on the image of the left show different altitudes. So this is a topographic map. So we have one 
chain of mountains down the center of the peninsula and another chain here and then the largest mountains uh, in the center there. On the right, it shows the Kamchatka Peninsula. This is another image from the MODIS sensor on the Terra satellite. It actually shows what it looks like covered by snow and ice. But it's not just snow and ice. We also have swirling clouds out here. And you see this dark pattern here? This is volcanic ash. There's some very active volcanoes in this part of the world that actually leave volcanic ash on top of the snow and ice that we can see from space. I should also mention that the image on the right and almost all the images that you see are made up of light that's reflected off the surface of the Earth. The, the, the light originated from the sun. So the sun shines on the Earth, and that visible wavelength light and the infrared light reflects, and the satellite sees it. The image on the left, which is the radar image, is different. In that case, the, the pulse of energy was actually produced by the satellite, which then bounced off to the surface of the Earth and went back up into space and was recorded. This is an image that uh, covers a, an area uh, probably about uh, 130 miles wide or you know, close to 100 kilometers wide, showing Mount Kenya in the country of Kenya, second largest mountain on that continent. It's a very tall mountain that's near the equator. Now, again, this is not real color. If you were to go to Kenya, that mountain wouldn't look bright red. The reason it looks bright red is that we've used the color red here to indicate the reflectance of near-infrared light. Now, what that means is that shows us the presence of vegetation. Plant leaves reflect really strongly in that kind of light. We can't see that light with our eyes, but the satellite can. So wherever you see bright red, that means there's a lot of plant life. And in this case, you see there's this ring around the mountain where there's a lot of rainfall and a lot of vegetation. But then as the mountain keeps getting taller and taller, the clouds eventually run out of moisture, so it's very dry up here, so there's very little vegetation. At the very top of the mountain, we have some snow and ice cover right there in the center of the image. This is an image actually from a part of northwestern China, and it actually shows a variety of different kinds of geology. Running diagonally through the image is actually a series of topographic faults. These faults are actually where a lot of earthquakes occur. Down here in the lower right, we actually have uh, some uh, uh, lake beds that have dried up, revealing some salt deposits. And on the upper part of the image, up there, we actually have sand dunes. So in this one image, covering a, an area of, of probably close to 180 uh, kilometers on a side, uh, we have different, all these different kinds of land cover. And it's very visible because it's so arid. It, it rains very rarely in this part of the world. So we can actually see that geology. You can see one little group of clouds down here. See these puffy clouds? You can tell the clouds because they cast shadows on the, on the ground. Whereas when you look at, at that area there, there's no shadows, so you know that there's no clouds. It must be the white colors from something else. Another thing you can see from uh, space are these, uh, the impact of water and ice on the surface of the Earth. You're looking at the, at the Lambert Glacier in Antarctica. This is another image from the Landsat 7 satellite. This glacier moves very quickly uh, from the, the uh, Antarctic continent out in, into the ocean. And uh, the ridges there uh, are actually are small shadows being cast uh, by some of the tiny shapes within uh, the glacier. Now here's an image that's been color-coded to show uh, differences in, in ocean water. Let me use my pointer here. So this is North America right here. There's the Chesapeake Bay on the east coast of the United States. Uh, and here's, here's uh, the outer banks of, of North Carolina right here. This color that you see here actually shows uh, the differences in, in chlorophyll content. Now, chlorophyll you may have heard of. That's what's in leaves, it's the green stuff that's used in photosynthesis. Well, organisms in the ocean also use it, and the satellites actually map the presence of that chlorophyll. In this case, we're actually showing the impact of the Gulf Stream. It's this stream of relatively warm water right here that's moving from south to north. And sometimes swirls form in the Gulf Stream. There's one right there. They call them gyres, where there's a different presence of chlorophyll uh, in this one little part of, of the ocean. And that's important for mapping how the ocean changes through time because the amount of chlorophyll tells us how, many, uh, how much life can be supported in that particular part of the ocean. This is the delta of the Lena River as it flows in the Arctic Ocean from Russia. Now, again, this is another one of those false color images, so these colors are not real. Uh, but 
the river flows from the bottom of this uh, image to the top. The north is up in this image. And again, th this image is probably 150 to 160 miles on a side. So this is a protected wildlife area in this part of Russia with, that's co covered by wetland vegetation. Here's another example of how water can impact the surface of the earth. This dark feature right here is the Nile River flowing through Egypt. And this whole area here, this colored gray, is the city of Cairo. And the bright colored areas to the left and right are, are desert. So there's very little growing there. Now, just like you saw in another image, see the bright red color. This red color also indicates the presence of vegetation. In this case, you're mostly looking at agricultural land. So this is irrigated agricultural land that's reflecting strongly in the infrared light that we can't see with our eyes, but we color code it red to make it visible here. And you can easily see the difference between the urban part of Cairo and then the agricultural land around it, and then this very stark uh, dividing line between that area and, and the desert uh, area beyond. Now, if you look right here at the end of my pointer, you see there's two little dark shapes right off the end of my pointer there. That's a nice segue into the next image I'm going to show you, which is going to zoom into those uh, uh, two things, because that's what they are. Those are the pyramids of Giza outside of, of Cairo, because another thing that we see very plainly when we look at satellite images is that people are everywhere, and we, we leave our impact uh, wherever we go, and it's easy to see some of that impact. In this case, we're looking at a very detailed uh, uh, image from QuickBird. This was collected back in 2002 that shows the famous pyramids uh, as, of Giza outside uh, Cairo. And you can see here's uh, where people live right here. That's the Sphinx right there, that guy. And if you look behind the, the text here, do you see uh, those? That's, sometimes people can guess what these are. This is a golf course. Golf courses are always easy to see uh, in, in satellite images. And it looks like uh, perhaps golf balls. <laughs> it's so you're well, well, we can't. Uh, let me go back. We, we can't quite see golf balls, but you, you, you see, you see, the, the light spots are are sand traps. Yeah, it doesn't seem like Which, you're too far away from having the resolution to perhaps see a golf ball at this point. Well, from from a satellite in space, it's unlikely we'll be able to see individual golf balls just because of uh, you're limited by how big the satellites are and the interference from the atmosphere. Mm. Uh, but you can get down to seeing objects a lot smaller than, than a car, for instance. Um, and, th and that data, are actually, you, you can buy those data uh, right now from different uh, satellite companies. Up until 10, 15 years ago, only reconnaissance satellites, satellites used by uh, you know, intelligence and, and military agencies, were capable of that kind of detail. But that's changed in recent years. Amazing. We have a, just a quick detour. Go ahead. Um, there's a number of questions about pointing these satellite images into outer space and looking at other planets. Um, we hear a lot about um, the detection of planets that might uh, be able to support life. Um, and yeah. It sounds like some of the techniques that we're seeing here by which you can identify things like chlorophyll would be the same kinds of things, perhaps, that, um, uh, that these satellites are detecting when they are looking uh, into the uh, into outer space? Yeah, some of the things that we're, we're, that we're seeing in these images are the same kinds of things that scientists look for sometimes when you look at, at other planets. Um, but we would use very different tools to do it. Uh, these particular satellites are only useful for looking down at the surface of the Earth. If we want to get a close look at another planet, let's say Mars, what we do is we send a satellite to orbit around Mars. And some of, the, some of the instruments, some of the sensors that those satellites use are very similar. Some of my colleagues uh, here at the Air and Space Museum do that kind of science where they actually look at Mars. Now, there's a whole different kind of science where actually astronomers look out to other stars and other solar systems. And they're a long way away from being able to detect uh, these things. But they use somewhat similar instruments, but instead of mounted on satellites, they're, they're attached to very large telescopes. Okay. Thanks, Andrew. So, all right. Well, let me show you some other examples of what we can see about uh, humans. Uh, here's, uh, this is New York City. Uh, the colors here are a little bit closer to what we would see with our eyes, 
but of course they're not quite realistic. Uh, the large, uh, the bright green rectangle you see here is Central Park in the middle of uh, Manhattan. This is Midtown Manhattan right here and Downtown Manhattan. Now, especially Midtown has a slightly darker area because they're all the skyscrapers casting shadows. And this is the Hudson River flowing through the middle of the river. This is from the Landsat 7 satellite. And this is the kind of data that we use uh, to actually look at changes in urban areas. We want to answer questions like, how do cities change through time? And, and what, how does the land surface change as cities get larger? Here's another kind of land surface uh, change. Uh, this is uh, not an urban area. This is all agriculture uh, in uh, Kansas. The Arkansas River flows through the upper part of this image right there. And you see all these circles. All the circles that you see on the image, uh, each of those circles is uh, much larger than a football field, to give you an idea of the scale. You could, uh, for a lot of these circles, you would probably be able to fit three or four or even five football fields within each circle. And that's from center pivot irrigation. It's a kind of irrigation where there's a large arm that goes uh, radiates out in a circle and, and drops water on the, on the uh, land surface to grow crops. The red circles are where crops are being grown, and the white circles are where it's either fallow or it's already been harvested. So we can actually use these satellites to show changes in agriculture. That's one of the, another one of the main applications of these kinds of satellites, because we want to know how many crops are being grown and where, and how much uh, area does it take up. Here's a really neat image showing the surface of the Earth. Sometimes people think it looks like stars, uh, but it's not. Uh, this is the Earth at night. Now let me explain what you're seeing. It's not an image that shows a snapshot. This is, a, this is made up of data from satellites that has been collected over many months. One tip is that if you look at the, this image, you can see the, this is Greenland up here. It's not, not blue. They added this blue layer so that you can see this is Africa here, Caspian Sea here. But the light-colored areas are mostly street lights. So this is Western Europe right here. There's the boot of Italy right there, Sicily. There's Great Britain. There's the Iberian Peninsula. There's the city of Madrid right there. That's Paris. Moscow's right there. This stringy thing here is, again, the Nile River. The Nile River itself is not glowing, but all the streetlights in, uh, in Egypt, well, almost all of them, are, almost all the people there live close to the Nile, so that's why it looks like that. And you can just see North America uh, over here. Now, this was made from a, uh, an instrument on board one of those polar orbiting uh, satellites. This actually was designed to look at uh, reflected moonlight from clouds. But after they launched it, they could actually, it turns out, they could make a map showing where uh, street lights are. And this shows you the extent of the urban areas on the surface of the Earth and how far... Uh, widespread they are, and people, geographers actually use, have used maps like these to actually map uh, the presence of urbanization across the surface of the earth. Uh, another thing that we do uh, when we look at the human presence is we actually notice uh, these urban areas are everywhere, and it really does show how people have spread and uh, extended along roads of commerce across the earth. In the background there, you're seeing downtown San Francisco and the skyscrapers uh, uh, there. Uh, that's from the Arcanos satellite. These are the kinds of detailed images that actually show you uh, really fine uh, details. This is Sydney, Australia, uh, the, the famous uh, opera house down here and the harbor bridge uh, right up there and the, and the port uh, uh, right in the middle uh, of that image. Uh, this is the uh, a port in Hamburg, Germany. You see all the little tiny rectangles are actually containers that are either going out on ships or coming back. So the ships come to dock and, they, and their cargo is left out here uh, for the satellite to see. This is an image taken by the QuickBird satellite uh, about almost 10 years ago now, actually. Um, and each one of these uh, rectangles that you see is the size of a truck. So that, that gives you an idea of, of the scale, each of these little tiny rectangles. Now, these kinds of images are actually used to do things like, uh, like plan the future of cities, see how things are changing in cities and how they're not, where there's room for expansion in, for instance, a port, uh, maybe in Hamburg or, or somewhere else. Here's another example. This is O'Hare Airport outside Chicago from an image from the uh, Kano satellite. 
all, each of the long lines here are runways, of course, and then the terminal area in the center. These are the images that are similar in scale to the photographs that we uh, can also collect from airplanes. And at this particular airport, they're actually planning an additional runway. I believe it'll go out here somewhere. Uh, so it's useful for that kind of planning purposes. And then I wanted to finish with uh, one last theme uh, that I'm calling dynamic Earth, because another main thing that we do with these images is we look at changes. The Earth's surface does not stay the same. It actually always changes through time. In the background there, you're seeing part of the country of Bolivia, and it actually shows a lot of change. You see the darker areas are actually covered by, by trees, so forest. The lighter areas have been cleared for agriculture. So at one time, 50 years ago, this entire area, which is probably uh, about 80 miles uh, over 100 kilometers wide, it looked like this dark color, but now it's been changed uh, to uh, make it useful for agriculture. The tree cover has been cleared. I've got another example of that, in this case in, in south-central Brazil. These two images show the exact same uh, part of the land in, in, in that part of Brazil, 25 years apart. On the left, from the Landsat 1 satellite, shows the 1976. You can see there was one road that went through this part of Brazil, and then there were other roads leading off. But all this area out here was covered uh, by, by dense vegetation cover. 25 years later, in 2001, from, the la from uh, a later Landsat satellite, you can see the same area. There's that same road right here but now much more of the vegetation has been cleared. And this is a process that we see happening in, in a lot of parts of the world where more people move out to these areas and, and clear the existing vegetation cover uh, to make room for, for agriculture. And it, and it has some important impacts on uh, the not just the land surface, but even uh, the atmosphere, both locally uh, and globally. Here's another example of looking at change. This is slightly more uh, dramatic. Uh, at the top part of this image is the city of Banda Aceh in, uh, um, uh, there, uh, which was impacted uh, very uh, severely by the Indian Ocean tsunami that you probably uh, remember uh, hearing about. Uh, on the left is an, is an image from January of 2003, and on the right, the exact same area uh, from uh, December 2004, just three days after the tsunami. And this is the main settled part of the town here, half of which is, are, is, is still uh, underwater. And the center area that you see right there, low-lying agricultural areas, was completely inundated. Now, this area has, has come a long way uh, to recovering, but I just show this image to make the point that these kinds of satellite images are very useful for disaster response because you can quickly and easily make maps of, of, of affected areas. And another, uh, one last image of change. This actually shows... Uh, the area, this is Southern California right here. The Pacific Ocean is on the left. This is Baja California right there. This line here was actually added to this image. It is, 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 this is the border between U.S. and Mexico. It's, it is not this obvious uh, in, in the image. But you see these large plumes here. This is smoke from forest fires. This image was actually collected in, in October 2003 uh, from the MODIS sensor on the Terra satellite. And these are some of the biggest uh, forest fires that, uh, that Southern California has ever seen. Uh, that's San Diego right there under the pointer, so it's maybe not a good day to be in San Diego when this image was collected. With these kinds of satellites, we, no we can not only see the plumes of smoke, but we can also map where fires are actually burning because we can directly detect the heat from the fires. And one of the things that we've learned looking at the whole Earth uh, at once uh, uh, from these different satellite products is uh, some of the important impact that burns and fires have on the Earth's land surface and also uh, the Earth's atmosphere. So that's a very quick tour of different kinds of things you can see uh, from uh, Earth orbit looking down on the surface uh, of the Earth. Uh, it's a rich topic, and I'm really happy to stick around and answer questions. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you, Andrew. Um, what an amazing whirlwind uh, tour from outer space of our planet. Uh, we do have a number of questions. Um, one question relates to your own background as a geographer and getting into this field. Uh, it seems like a fair number of these very exciting tools for looking at the Earth um, are relatively new in terms of their uh, complexity and the resolution of the images they provide. When you chose a career uh, in geography, um, could you have imagined that the tools you'd have today would be producing such vivid images? And and you went into the field that it, um, 
uh, what, what excited you initially about the field you chose? Yeah, actually, what excited me about the field were the presence of some of these tools. Uh, I've been doing this for long enough to see the process change. How we actually use these kinds of images has changed a lot over the last 20 years. Uh, but even 20 years ago, uh, we, we knew some of the interesting possibilities that existed. And actually, this kind of view from overhead has always excited me. Even as a very young person, I remember I had a map of drawers in my, uh, uh, sorry, a drawer of maps in my, in my bedroom, and I would have fun pouring through the maps. I just enjoyed looking at that cartographic view. I enjoyed seeing how different landforms are related, why certain cities are located where they are and not, and not other places. I've always enjoyed thinking about that. And then later, when it was time for me to decide what I wanted to be when I grew up, uh, there were all these interesting tools for exploring those kinds of questions, and I really uh, enjoyed looking at some of these images and then eventually using them to actually try to answer uh, in interesting questions. Uh, the The tools are technically focused, but uh, what one of the things that has changed over the last 20 years is that uh, the the computers that we use to do this have actually gotten smaller and more simple. When I started 20 years ago, the computers that we used were the size of a car, uh, and now we use ordinary computers that you can use on your desktop, but we use very complicated software to manipulate these data. So, um, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting field, and, and it's, it's one that's, uh, there's a lot to explore, but people can get into it fairly simply. You, you look at images like this uh, on a daily uh, basis. I'm wondering if, uh, Certain images, or even one that you might describe to us, has a particularly emotional response when you look at it. Are there times when uh, the images you're looking at um, move you in ways that you might not expect? Sometimes I've had the experience of looking at things that are changing uh, very recently. Uh, I, you remember many years ago the, the, the flooding in New Orleans. And I, I had an opportunity to actually look at some detailed images showing that city uh, while it was still going on, and I, it almost felt like I was there. Uh, so that's, that can be uh, a moving pro uh, 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 feeling. The other time I've, I've felt that emotional uh, reaction are some of the images that you've actually seen today. Uh, I've included a few of them that almost look like abstract art. Uh, these, none of these images were collected to be pretty pictures. They were designed for technical and scientific purposes. But sometimes they're actually processed in a way that they almost look, uh, as I said, like abstract art. And that interests me. It, it's interesting how the overhead view can inspire visual art. It's, and speaking of art, I'm going to take a quick glance at our illustrator, uh, Chris Wilson's view of Earth from <laughs> Space, it uh, looks fascinating. Uh, which he's been uh, busy at work drawing for us. This is a live view of Chris's desktop uh, uh, from the UK. Um, very nice, Chris. Thank you. Uh, he's continuing at it right now. Uh, there was a question from Stevie about whether you could comment on the final image that we had. I'm going to absolutely uh, and maybe a little bit about um, about what we're seeing there. Yeah, the final image there is another one of these uh, views that has been. Uh, 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 synthesized from many different uh, data sources. There's no clouds in this image. So this was uh, uh, put together uh, from a satellite uh, that was designed to look at weather patterns, but also uh, different, uh, two different satellites, one that looks at weather patterns and one that looks at land surface, and they actually made a global mosaic. So it's actually possible to actually spin this image around and zoom uh, in and out. Uh, I can't do it for you on the screen here, uh, but what you're looking at is North America there. It's still centered on the city where I'm sitting, Washington, D.C. You, you can't tell because it's so tiny, uh, but I am right there. Uh, but you remember early on in the, uh, uh, in the presentation, I actually had images zooming into Washington, D.C., and it comes from the same uh, data source. This bright white area that you see up here, this is all uh, snow and ice cover. Uh, so this is a this is a winter image uh, in the northern hemisphere showing the full extent of some snow and ice cover over the Arctic Ocean, and the different colors on the land surface indicate different patterns of vegetation. So you can see there's there's more vegetation here and and, and less vegetation here. 
This was designed to look roughly like the kinds of uh, colors you would, you would see with your eyes. Although if you were in space looking down with your eyes, the colors would not be this bright and vibrant. There's a number of questions here. Unfortunately, we won't have time to get to all of them right now, but I wanted to just see if we could sneak in a couple more. Um, this sure. one's from Maria, who you talked a little bit about how satellite images are used for uh, urban uh, planning and urban development yeah. purposes. Um, when they look at uh, images for that purpose, are they simply looking at spatial arrangements, or are they also looking at some of the other things you looked at, like the effect on vegetation um, and the impact on, uh, uh, on for example, uh, climate change? Yeah, both. Uh, most of the, every planning agency in every city uh, needs to have some images so that they know where buildings are uh, in their city. It's been most common to use images from airplanes, you can actually put cameras on airplanes, and they return highly detailed images. Whereas uh, now, you can actually get images that are just as good from, from satellites, and in, in some times, they can actually be an improvement. So planning boards and, and uh, government agencies use these kinds of images for that. But then there are other scientists that actually use these images uh, to look at the physical makeup of the city and how it changes through time. How much tree cover exists in a city and, and how it changes uh, through time. Uh, the, the kinds of vegetation we have in urban areas are becoming more and more common on the surface of the earth because we have more and more urban areas and they cover uh, more of the earth's land surface. So right now there's a, there's a whole field of science actually looking at, at urban areas as urban ecosystems and trying to understand how they work. And these kinds of images are also used for that. Jonathan, are you there? Oh, I guess it would help if I unmuted my button there. Uh, no, so, it's, it's all right. <laughs> um, quick question about how long it takes for the satellite images to reach uh, Earth and how uh, often yes. the satellites need it, to be replaced. The, the images, uh, the, all this data are, are digital data, just like with your digital camera, and they're transmitted to the surface of the Earth, and they take a fraction of a second for those signals to get to the surface of the Earth because these satellites... Are most of the satellites that you've seen here in this presentation are a few hundred miles above the surface of the Earth. The, 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 those weather satellites are a couple thousand miles away. But even so, the signals move at the speed of light, so it, it takes a fraction of a second. What takes longer is that once the data are received on the ground, they have to be processed so that they can be made into visual uh, pictures. And, and depending on the system, you know, that can take hours or it can de take days and weeks. How, long do, how often do the satellites need to be replaced? Well, these satellites last, you know, several years at a time. Uh, sometimes satellites last longer. We're still using a satellite called Landsat 5 that was actually launched back in 1984. Uh, and some of the images that you've seen today uh, came from that satellite. And it, they we're still using it because the satellites that were meant to replace it didn't make it into orbit or have broken down already. Uh, but most satellites last, you know, but between five and ten years, and, and then they need to be replaced uh, by, by other uh, spacecraft. Great. Well, I hope everyone will, will join me in thanking Andrew Johnston for taking time to give us a tour of what our planet looks like from outer space, and in, in particular how much it, um, our effect on it can be noted and uh, the changes that we're seeing, uh, both natural and, and man-made. It's a, a pretty remarkable view. I did want to encourage everybody to check out both the teacher's guide and the uh, Taking a Global Virtual Classroom site. Uh, you can find links to both of those from shoutlearning.org because there's some great ways to continue this exploration, some wonderful activities on making some maps of your local area uh, and, um, and testing your, your skill with some, some interesting uh, geography from space uh, quizzes and activities that you'll find. So I hope you'll check that out. Um, don't forget also, as I mentioned, there's the Shout Taking It Global uh, Global uh, Classroom, the, uh, which you'll find also from shoutlearning.org. We hope you'll check that out. And I hope you'll also join me in thanking the convening partners that brought today's session to all of you today, uh, the Smithsonian, Microsoft Partners in Learning, and Taking It Global. Andrew, thank you again for being here. It was a pleasure. Thanks very much. It was my pleasure. And uh, remember, we'll be back in about six or seven minutes with Josh Falk, who's going to give us a tree banding update on the Citizen Science Project. And he'll also explain, if you're not already part of it, 
how you can get involved. So either way, we hope you'll stay right where you are and join us for the next session. Thanks, everybody.